Welcome to the Veterinary Cancer Pioneers podcast, the show where we delve into groundbreaking work of veterinary professionals who are dedicated to advancing the field of veterinary oncology. I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Venable, and I'm thrilled to embark on this journey with you. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm honored to be here as we shine the light on remarkable individuals who are pushing the boundaries of veterinary medicine to combat one of the most formidable foes our pets face, cancer. In this podcast, we'll probe the minds of veterinary cancer pioneers, those who have dedicated their careers to unraveling the mysteries of this complex disease. We'll explore breakthrough research and discuss the latest advancements and diagnostic techniques that are paving the way for personalized treatment plans tailored to each individual animal. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest, Dr. Kevin Choi. Dr. Choi is a board certified veterinary medical oncologist at Blue Pearl Veterinary Specialist in Kirkland, Washington. He completed his oncology residency at Washington State And his professional interests include lymphoma, transitional cell carcinoma, and local treatment with electrochemotherapy and translational cancer research. He has co-authored studies and published chapters in books. Without further ado, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Kevin Choi. Thank you so much for being here today. We're truly honored to have you as our very first guest on this inaugural episode of the Veterinary Cancer Pioneers podcast. Thank you for that great introduction, Rachel. Oh, you're welcome, Dr. Choi. So tell me a little bit more about yourself. Where are you from and uh, where what got you into veterinary medicine? So that's a great question. Um, I actually... Uh, was uh, and I'm an I'm an only child, so I actually grew up with a lot of animals all the time. So they were kind of like my brothers and sisters. And the first time I was kind of exposed to veterinary medicine um, was actually in high school when a lot of our pets, you know, needed vaccinations and general care as well. And I decided, you know, that's something I really wanted to get into in terms of being in medicine. And in Canada, they actually have a a course called career and personal planning, where they match you with different medical fields. So you can kind of see if that fits for you. So I volunteered, you know, at a human hospital, and I, you know, volunteered at a dental practice and didn't really appeal to me. And when I went back and shadowed with a veterinarian, I really resonated with me in terms of being able to see a lot of variety of different cases, a lot of different species as well. And that's really what prompted me to go towards uh, veterinary medicine. That's really fun. You know, I had a a little dog growing up that I would actually call my brother. So I get, even though I did have an older human sister, I Mm -hmm. did actually have a little dog brother. So I get what you're saying and can only imagine as an only child, right? That you were probably pretty close to your pets growing up. Mm -hmm. So you're from Canada. What, what brought you into the States? Yeah. So I did my, um, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, and I did my undergraduate degree in animal sciences towards getting a veterinary degree. And actually my road to being an oncologist was actually one that circled the whole Pacific Ocean. So I actually, once I did my degree, uh, just like any other Canadian or most U.S. Uh, you know, veterinary uh, aspirating um, uh, students as well, it was very difficult to get into vet school. So after a few applications, I decided to expand my horizons and look overseas, and I was very fortunate to be accepted into the vet program at University of Melbourne, Australia. And after spending seven years there, uh, four years uh, in vet school and three years in general practice, I decided that I wanted to do a lot more in terms of specialization. And that really came about due to two experiences. When I was in general practice, I really liked uh, my interactions with my clients and caring for them, but I felt like I was the jack of all trades and the master of none of them. And I started referring a lot of my patients when they were diagnosed with cancer to a local specialist clinic, the Melbourne Veterinary Referral Center. And I started actually calling over the phone to the oncologist, and she's a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Maureen Cooper, who's a board-certified oncologist. And she kept saying, you don't sound Australian. And I said, you don't sound Australian either. We both found out we were both from Canada, and we actually lived a few hours from each other. And it was a very small world, and we both ended up in Australia. So um, I actually ended up learning a lot about oncology as as a specialty, actually, from her 
and decided that it's something I wanted to pursue. And to connect with that Australian um, uh, sort of connection, I actually had uh, a friends whose uh, relatives were actually on faculty at different teaching hospitals. And uh, a professor, Simon Turner at Col uh, Colorado State University was a large animal surgeon, but he actually helped me um, in terms of the application process, how to go through the match in terms of internships and residency. And then I ended up um, getting an internship at Oregon State and doing a residency at Washington State. And I've been here at uh, Blue Pearl Kirkland for the last 10 years. That's an amazing story. How exciting that you're able to see the world as well as seeing lots of aspects of veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the whole process, it, it's quite a, an event, right? Just trying to get into vet school. Mm -hmm. And then the match, as you mentioned, having somebody help guide you, I think that can be a, a real help because the whole internship residency thing, it's it's a challenge. I think a lot of our younger vets are trying to decide where to go, right? Do they specialize? Do they do internships? Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's quite the feat. Do you work with any interns there at the specialty hospital you're at now? Yes, and that, that's a really big part of why I sort of came to the, you know, clinical practice as well at uh, Blue Pearl Kirkland, really for the clinical aspects, but also a, a big part of my draw to oncology was a lot of the newer cutting edge research. It seems like in both human and veterinary medicine, there's always new drugs are developed, new technologies, and also new research as well. So I really... I'm very thankful for that, you know, for me, you know, getting into a residency, having training as well, really do a lot due to the part that, you know, I had a lot of mentors, so very good mentors that supported me throughout um, the whole process. And uh, a big part of that was me now trying to uh, be a mentor to the future generations of uh, veterinarians as well. So our uh, hospital actually has a pretty robust uh, rotating internship program. Uh, we have a res residency program. Uh, we used to have one in neurology. Uh, we still have one in surgery as well. And I'm very fortunate um, to have an opportunity to have a specialty internship at our hospital. And we're now into our fifth year of training uh, specialty oncology interns. Oh, well, that's amazing. It's, I think it's so important to give back to your profession right? That's how we can grow it and keep it going and make it strong. So that's, that's amazing. I'm glad that you're doing that. I, you also mentioned, you know, new technologies and keeping up with the different drugs and things. So what is a new technology right now that you find particularly promising for oncology? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me. I think there's really three main areas I feel like uh, in both human and veterinary medicine, where it's actually very exciting. One, of course, is in the field of uh, diagnostics. Uh, so not only are we getting better at diagnosing cancers, but also subtyping them, um, also looking at more of not just a traditional histologic, how does it look like under the microscope, but also from a genetic or from a pathway um, standpoint. So why did these cells become cancerous in the first place? And that could that potentially guide things like prognosis and treatment? A lot of that initially was really slow growing in human medicine. A lot of it was very done by, you know, for PhD, postdoc, PhD, everything was done um, very, very step by step. You know, for example, look at the whole, you know, human genome project. Everything was sequenced manually and had to be put in manually. But now we can leverage use of, you know, supercomputing, artificial intelligence. You know, there are some risks, as you know, in the news, but we're learning more and more about it to refine our knowledge and actually get more useful real life clinical data. So the second thing would be use of artificial intelligence and big data management as well to make sense of all the data that we're generating. And third, of course, would be newer uh, treatment categories or therapeutics. So in the past, I tell people that oncology, we're simple folk. We only have about three or four ways of treating things, surgery, radiation, traditional chemo, and maybe immunotherapies or targeted biologics. And it's that last area that's getting really exciting where potentially newer and newer uh, drugs are identified, not only to necessarily uh, treat patients based on maybe genetic status or mutation status or pathway changes as well, but potentially maybe avoid certain side effects that traditional chemotherapies can have. So all three of those. Yeah, those are, are 
those are great. I agree with those. Those are really the areas that are really emerging. It's exciting. You know, we kind of follow behind human medicine so often in veterinary and, and it is exciting as they're getting more advances in people, you know, kind of how, how we can learn and, and take away from those things too. And, and talking about AI and big data platforms, I understand that you contributed to some of the research platform for Impermed when it was first yep. starting. So how did you find out about that? Yeah, and I would say I always tell people I I I, I don't like to take a little any credit, but it's like maybe contribute a little bit, just a few cases a, as well. And it was actually by um, happy circumstance um, in that during my residency, uh, the two big projects that I had, and I was told by my mentor, you always have a very easy project that you can complete because that's part of your training. But then you can always have big aspirations to have a more uh, forward prospective uh, trial that has more, like say, clinical impact as well. And one of my big areas of interest in oncology is translational um, oncology. So things that not only can help other animals uh, as well, and how you we you and I practice medicine um, on a day to day basis, but potentially it could help the pet parent as well. So maybe if the owner has cancer, and how can that affect multiple species? Because everything's so similar uh, as well. So um, one of my projects during my residency was with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in, uh, here in Seattle. So this is one of the you know biggest NIH funded. Um, research cancers for humans in, in the US, in fact, in fact, the world as well. So we were very fortunate to work with a lot of researchers there. And one of the big projects was developing an in vivo, so inpatient lymphoma chemotherapy assay. And um, we basically had to inject chemotherapeutics into patients, into lymph nodes, and then have them retrieved. And they would analyze the lymph nodes for um, you know, success or failure. And that was very interesting to me. And so I already had a keen interest in research and also lymphoma drug sensitivity assays. So I think this was back in 2018 or 2019, I call it the before times. Um, there was a conference in, um, in Las Vegas actually called the Veterinary Science of Oncology. So it's a very research centered uh, conference. And uh, at one of those conferences, I actually met uh, the Impermit uh, team when they were st first developing their product. And I kind of, we got chatting as well, and um, we found that we had a lot of similarities uh, in terms of interests as well. And because I think my background in lymphoma drug um, sensitivity research, they decided to reach out to me and uh, see if I was willing to submit more samples. And at the time, I was very keen um, to support their research. And over time, that grew through many years and it's culminated in them asking me um, to work as a consultant for them. And I've been working with them for the last two years uh, with, uh, as a consultant. Wow, that just shows how important networking is, right? Like you never know who you're gonna meet or how things might intertwine because Impermed does some translational research as well, right? As far as they have a human side where they're doing assays and different things, I believe, as well as for the veterinary side. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is, you were saying, you know, uh, you know, humans always get the things, you know, all the treatments and all the new toys and the new, you know, drug therapies first. I like to feel that this is one of the few areas we've kind of turned the tables where we get, we get a lot of things first in animals. And um, not only am I seeing, you know, quite encouraging new results that help change clinical practice uh, in veterinary medicine, but this is now starting to potentially trickle on into impacting how clinical practice is made in human oncology as well. So uh, they've actually had some good collaborative research projects with actually major uh, well-known hospitals in both the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States as well. Wow, that's really exciting. We'll definitely have to keep up with that and see where everything's going. Because I, I think a lot of us on veterinary oncologists, we love translational. We want to we want to help everyone, right? Mm -hmm. The dogs and the people. So that's exciting that Impermed is involved with that. And for the veterinary side, how are you using Impermed? Yeah, so back in, you know, around 2018, 19, um, when the company was first starting, I feel like they did the research, you know, the proper way. They they offered the test for free because it was still data gathering. Um, we didn't know really the sensitivity, specificity, or reliability of the data. So it was more they were offering a service um, to both uh, potentially help the clients, but also we would help further research. And how I offered it to clients was that, hey, the price is right, it's free, it's no charge. And it offered initially two main um, benefits. One, 
it provided a lymphoma phenotyping. So what type of lymphoma you have, um, and that by itself was a really good prognostic, you know, in indicator as well, like B cell versus T cell, indolent versus more high grade lymphoma. So admittedly, I was actually using it for free phenotyping at the time. And I said, well, you could also get a potential side benefit in that um, you could actually potentially de uh, determine which drugs would be more effective. And that would really support, do I use standard of care, like a Wisconsin Madison chop based protocol, or should I potentially use something else? But I did uh, tell clients, you should take that with a really big grain of salt because it was still very uh, developing. Over time, um, as they've gotten more case material, they've actually evolved their testing. They've gone through multiple generations of uh, modeling and uh, reports in terms of the formatting, how they present the data as well, and how they interpret the data. I felt like that um, their reliability and clinical applicability has actually increased quite significantly. And now when I do offer it to clients, I, as a standard of care for my practice, I phenotype all my patients. So I feel like really we should be moving away from, you know, the old way of we treat all lymphoma the same. They all, you know, get treated with CHOP and if they don't respond, then we'll move to something else. And there's really good studies to show that if you don't put your first first foot forward, that when you are in a rescue or relapse situation, a lot of the treatments really don't work as well and they don't work as long. So you are, we are doing a disservice to the patients by doing a blanket approach and we're not moving towards a more personalized medicine, particularly for lymphoma. So I do offer phenotyping. So and I actually have shifted my practice to using um, essentially Impermet for nearly all of our lymphoma phenotyping in dogs now. And really just because it's, it's very price competitive, but also the turnaround time is very quick. Um, and it's within 72 hours, I actually get both flow cytometry and clonality par uh, back. And that allows me to make decisions quite quickly. Um, the other part of it, then I tell clients, hey, if we're doing phenotyping, if you want more information, there is a newer emerging diagnostic test. There still only has been done in about, you know, 4,000 patients. So it's still a relatively small sample size when you compare it to, say, a human diagnostic test. But I've used it for a few years now. I mean, I'm comfortable interpreting results. And I tell clients very intuitively, it's kind of very similar to something that they're familiar with, say like a bacterial culture and sensitivity, where they keep certain cells alive, cancer cells versus bacteria, and they basically subject it to a variety of different drugs. And in our case, not antibiotics, but chemotherapeutics to see potentially what would work and what the best uh, course of action would be. And I feel like a lot of clients, when I describe it that way, they have a very intuitive, easy to understand way of saying, hey, I understand that, that makes sense to me. And I know that's still very, you know, it's still emerging. And a lot of clients, I feel like I, when I do the phenotyping, I recommend that and I offer the upgrade also to the drug sensitivity. It's actually a surprising amount of clients will take me up on that to upgrade that little bit extra to see if we can get more information. And that's in newly diagnosed patients. Um, they also like the fact that they're contributing to research that potentially could help other pets in the future. And also now, uh, because they have been working, the implement has been working with human um, oncologists and human hospitals, they like that feeling that potentially this could be helping with other uh, round cell or immune system malignancies, like their publications recently with multiple myeloma in humans, and potentially things like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in humans as well. So that's kind of, you know, the, the long roundabout way of me using it as a free service, but now offering it as part of my practice day to day. Wow, you said so many great things in that. I, I kind of want to pick apart some of it because there was a mm -hmm. lot of good takeaways there. You know, you mentioned with lymphoma of, you know, it's the blanket way of just treating everything with CHOP you know, is that really the best thing? Because I feel like that is, there's still a lot of debate with that, right? Because there's some papers showing T cell, you should treat with MOP or maybe mm -hmm. LOP. And then others showing, no, they didn't live as long versus, you know, just CHOP and all this kind of back and forth. And it, to me, where I also find it can get a bit frustrating is when you really look at those studies, there's not very many dogs, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you really, and I know you said 4,000 is a small data set, which it is probably compared to people, but in our vet studies, I mean, if we get 20 dogs, yep. <laughs> that's usually a yeah. lot, right? Yeah. And so um, I agree with you. It, it is, it's something where I feel like, especially anyone that's treated lymphoma, you know, they don't all behave the same, right? I've had 
some that fall along just like they're supposed to and others not at all, either in a good or bad way, you know? And, uh, and I like how you said that we're doing a disservice. I, I think, I think you're right by just, you know, but that is sort of the way I lean to where it's like, well, we can do chop and then see what happens, but you do feel like that there's gotta be something better, right? What, what if we could tease this out? And so how have you felt those drug predictions? What I know you said that we're still learning and the clients understand that, but how, how are you feeling? Cause I know they don't have the data, at least I don't believe they have data yet quite going towards that, but how have you felt, you know, changing up the protocols or that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So that's the ultimate holy grail in terms of, you know, in the future, uh, we would like to have a human or a dog patients where you'd be newly diagnosed with say a multicentric high grade lymphoma, kind of analogous to non Hodgkin's lymphoma in people, they would take a sample of your lymph node, you know, they would figure out what subtype it is. And also then have a, you know, a ranking of these are the, the top few drugs that we're using. And then you could make a customized chemotherapy protocol moving forward to say, we're going to use the top three or top four drugs. And of course, still a lot of prospective researches will need to be done to get to that point. And I feel like we're still a ways off from that. But I use it, the Impermed platform in my practice, two ways. Um, the naive, newly diagnosed patients. And currently, unless there's very significant changes, it's really to help me choose what's a very what's the best first line therapy for me based on the current standard of care or the current published literature. So I'm not going to really try to reinvent the wheel too, too much unless there's very significant data and without consultation with the client. So mainly for me, I'm deciding between do I use a standard CHOP protocol, say for a B cell lymphoma? Do I use maybe a Tenovia or Tenovia doxorubicin based protocol for some patients? Or if I do know that say a patient has a pre-existing uh, liver condition, I don't want to use like liver toxic drugs like lomustine, for example. Can I pick something that's in a similar drug category based on the drug um, assay or sensitivity where I can make a single drug substitution knowing that at least there is something on paper. Now, clinically, we're, um, I'm, we'll get into whether or not we're seeing that you know, match up well. I can at least have a little bit of conference, uh, confidence to say I can do some drug substitutions that way. So that's a naive patient. For naive or newly diagnosed T-cell patients, I feel like you know, we have a two, three uh, published studies right now you know, supporting maybe more towards a MOP or LOP-based therapies for naive T-cell lymphoma patients. I am actually seeing that reflected in some of our newly diagnosed uh, T-cell lymphoma patients I'm submitting to the platform. You know, they support use of more like alkylator heavy, like lomustine-based protocols. Uh, they show lower response to doxorubicin, and there's papers to, to show that right now for single dosing. And they also um, support use of uh, mechlorethamine or mestrogen-based protocol. So I am seeing that, you know, um, comfortingly uh, also reflected in the protocol itself. The other way I use it right now is also in relapse patients. And those are the ones that are the really tough ones. Um, once you get into a relapse situation, I think we've all been through that uh, scenario. We're all kind of play out the same unfortunate song in that it's not a matter of if, it's when it doesn't work, then we go to a plan C, then we go to a plan D, and then we're kind of delaying the inevitable. And I think I played that same broken record so many times, I was really desperate to find something else. Is there something else I can offer my clients, not just drugs and not just picking drugs randomly at this point and doing empirical therapy and seeing what happens? Is there a way that we can actually better a target or at least have a best guess or best estimate in terms of what a more likely responding drug would be to not only focus our finances and resources appropriately, but also for clients avoiding drugs that may have a lower likelihood of response. So you don't waste finances and resources and put the patient through unnecessary side effects as well. So those are kind of the two uh, main ways that I use it. Um, how do I feel in terms of overall observed response? Um, as each generation I've used, um, I feel like the, the dependability, at least subjectively, and they are very receptive to continue to improve their data set, their models, and publish. This is one of the few companies I've worked with where they're still publishing in peer-reviewed journals at least one or two a year, which is very, very good uh, in terms of at least having all the data out there being very transparent. And that's why I've continued to work with them uh, because of that 
strive forward. And I feel like the first model they had, you know, uh, was uh, very broad categories. They didn't really give a lot of percentages. They were very, um, I wouldn't say generic, but broad in the description. They used the words like mediocre response, you know, medium estimated response, or uh, likely to be effective. So it was, it was not a, you know, it was something, but it wasn't as clinically useful as ranking the drugs as well. And I would get things where, you know, uh, they would say, hey, CHOP, CHOP should work. And I used it and uh, the drugs didn't, you know, it relapsed pretty quickly and I would retest them and they would say, CHOP should still be working right now. And I would call them up or email to say, hey, what I'm seeing clinically is not working well with the report. And they were very, very open to getting more data, uh, you know, offering to repeat more samples for the patients for free for the sake of learning more about it to improve their model. And over the last five years, they've gone through multiple different iterations and models, and I've seen uh, the dependability of it a, a lot better now. Uh, in, in fact, I've had some case reports of some patients where I've used it, you know, uh, in both a naive setting when they're newly diagnosed to four relapses in, and you can actually see a very clear cut um, match in terms of the resistance pattern of drugs uh, showing up where the response rate starts to drop over time uh, to what you've observed. And then what I try, you know, one of the drugs in the top three rankings that they use, we generally, you know, I've seen a very good response in patients. So I've had some very durable repeated responses or reinductions of remissions using this repeatedly. So. Oh, that's really interesting. I, again, so many good points in there. And I and I think you're very right in saying, you know, how, especially for those relapse patients, which we know it's going to eventually happen, you know, how can we better target toward the best treatment? Because we know, you know, the more drugs you use, the more resistant the cancer gets, it's less responsive, but also just money too, you know, because we don't have the same level of insurance like they do in people with our dogs. And so how can we really target? Because so often oncologists, we talk about spinning the chemo wheel, right? Yeah. And there's got to be something better than that. And I, I know we all, hopefully everyone is looking at papers and looking at response, but still, when you stare at an individual dog, sometimes you're like, well, Will it be this drug or will it be that drug? So that is exciting that you've seen some actual clinical response, you know, like kind of what you're seeing from the data collection, what you're getting, and that especially the ones that you've tested more than once, like from the original, and then once they're resistant to things and you retest them, and that is actually showing that they are resistant. So that's exciting yeah. to see that the data is is following along. So that that is really interesting. And you know, with all, oh, and I guess, you know, even before I, I do want to make a point, you said about publishing studies. I, I think that's huge too. I talk to a lot of family vets and they'll ask me about various different products. And there's, there's a lot of companies out there that don't publish anything. And mm -hmm. those are the ones that always make me a bit nervous. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, a, and I feel like especially oncology there, there's a lot of companies they're like, oh, I just heard of this. Or, you know, pet owners will say, I just Googled this. And then you go to the website and there's nothing published. What what do you like to tell clients, you know, about some of those companies? Because I'm sure you get people that bring yeah. stuff to you that you can't find any data. Yeah. And in this day and age, uh, I would say uh, a big part of my practice and my consults, and I feel like my initial consultations for newly diagnosed clients, uh, I feel like even over the last 10 years has gotten longer and longer and longer. And, and I feel like it used to be, most of my conversation was on the tumor, the diagnosis, you know, what it is, why did my pet develop this? How is it likely to behave? Based on that, what uh, diagnostics would I recommend for your patient to help guide treatment? And ultimately we'll discuss prognosis. But I feel, I think it's empowering clients, but it's also a, a little bit to our dismay is that with the power of more information also uh, comes with a lot of power of a lot of misinformation as well. So I spend a lot of time actually going through a lot of things that clients have found on the internet themselves and explaining how to really critically analyze companies and data that you have and not all data, all because it's published in the internet, it's not all created equal uh, as well. So um, I have used a lot of diagnostic companies, um, even with clients, you know, uh, where they know that, you know, there's little to no published data, I will be very open with them. I said, I am willing to learn and try and try new things, uh, as long as it's not going to impact, say, the resources towards 
doing treatment. Um, if it's going to eat into that too much, I'd rather put that towards treatments to make your pet feel better at that point and treat their condition. But if, say, finances are not an issue, it's not going to be at a detriment to the, the patient, either due to delaying treatment or something that's very invasive to them, I would say more power to more information. But I do educate the clients in saying that uh, their platform may be initially, it's always based on some research, but it may be uh, based on preclinical research. It may be done on, you know, mouse models or, um, you know, non-dog models as well. And what it really amounts to in veterinary medicine is that you may be an out-of-pocket clinical trial. You are basically paying for their research at this point. And I, my little soapbox is that if they are doing that, uh, they really should be doing a service to the science community and trying to at least release data, you know, uh, present data on a timely basis, uh, whether or not it's good or bad, so that we can continue to move, move forward to help help clients as well. And I think you and I have well, uh, as well, we've We've seen a lot of you know these uh, these companies start up. It's a very exciting time for us, but we've also seen an equal number of these companies um, fail to either deliver or they may have had therapeutics. We've had actually new drugs and new immunotherapeutics have come and gone from the market as well. So I think it's really given us a more cautious approach to a lot of these uh, samples and, and treatment options as well. So it's more of a still wait and see. And that's why we have a very frank conversation with the clients and they have to really go into it with eyes open. That is not going to be a magic bullet. It's something that will be another tool in our tool belt, another bit of information to help us care for your patient. Well, I think that's great. I, I think it's good that you said that you're open-minded and willing to try. I'm such a data head. I really like all the data, um, but I, I can be open-minded. <laughs> But I, I am I lean towards being a big data head. So though I, I think that's I think that's great and very true. A lot of important nuggets, what you just said. And just in general, what do you think are the most significant challenges that we're starting to face now in, in veterinary oncology? So I think it's very similar to um human oncology. It I, I think we're really going to be you know, collecting data in a timely fashion knowing what to do with the whole bunch of data that we're getting, you know, finding a relevant and, and significant pattern that's true. And also then cost uh, uh, as these new fancy techniques, diagnostics and new drug options are available. You know, it's kind of scary when you think of say a metastatic melanoma patient in humans, some of these treatments per year for an average size human male could be coming up to a, like a, almost a million dollars, you know, a year if you don't have insurance and even then, it's still a big financial burden to the uh, average American or the average um, uh, person, you know, living in the world on on month to month wages as well. So I feel like um, you know leveraging new technologies to not only look at economies of scale, but also if we had limited resources, where's the best way to apply them uh, will be a, a big challenge. So yeah, that's true. I, I had a client once. Uh, wanted me to price out tremetinib. Um, it was for, you know, a, a targeted therapy. Mm -hmm. And I looked at, I, I want to, you know, it was a regular human pharmacy is where I was looking at, and it was going to be over $25,000 a month. So yep. it's like yep. what you said. I mean, it's just, if you're paying out of pocket and I actually worked with someone and it, it was one of those unfortunate, really sad stories where he had cancer and he couldn't afford his medication. So he started not taking as much taking breaks because he couldn't afford it. And he did end up succumbing to his cancer. And sometimes you just wonder like, could it have gone better, you know, yeah. if he could have afforded it. Right. And so it's, I think sometimes people forget because they think about dogs, but it's in people. This is actually a really mm -hmm. big topic as well. A lot of oncologists are publishing papers and things just about their clients can't afford it. So yeah. I think you're right. I think as all these new technologies emerge, we have to kind of balance the the expectations on pricing, you know, where, where does all that lie? How can we use the resources? So yes, I think, I think in people too, right. There, there's gotta be a better, a better way with some of this. How I, I don't unfortunately have the answer, but <laughs> I, I, I think it's. True. And I think that's from both ends too. So not only as these new technologies and new treatments are, they're all custom made or they're, you know, targeted biologics, immunotherapies. A lot of these take a lot of, you know, research and effort to build. But as we get better in it, I feel like um, the economies of scale and technology will help reduce a lot of this. You know, a case in point, again, DNA sequencing. It was all done by hand manually. You know, the I think to my recollection, 
the Human Genome Project, I think, took over five to six years uh, of, you know, multiple teams of postdoc PhD researchers to manually, you know, piece everything together as the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle. And now we talk about whole genome sequencing and, oh, we can get it done in an hour, you know, using the using a, a whole genome array and computer aided design. So uh, if, you know, in the future, my hope would be something like out of Star Trek, where they can, you know, have computers that, you know, can make these um, drugs on a molecular basis a lot, lot faster scale that will bring down the treatment side. But then right now, if we can even identify what drugs are more likely to work, we can use the limited resource that we have in a much more efficient way to not say do three treatments of chemotherapy and the cost and time involved with it, find out that it doesn't work. And now we have to go switch to something else. We could have kind of put our best foot forward. So that's also another way to help uh, provide treatments uh, to our patients. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's very true. That's a great idea. And in your experience, what's been the most rewarding aspect of working in veterinary oncology? I know we've talked about some of the challenges. So what, what's a positive? So, you know, the whole reason it's a full circle. I, I came about doing veterinary medicine because I liked, you know, science, medical aspects, and um, it ended up being kind of like treating my own brothers and sisters, you know, the, the pets in my family. And that's really what it comes down to. I feel like it's the not only the doctor patient relation and the bond that you form with them. I feel like oncology is one of the few fields where you see your patients over and over. And sometimes you actually see them for the rest of their lives. And you form really good relationships with not just the pets, but also with the clients. I feel like you're helping them through a very difficult time, good or bad as well. And now with a lot of translational oncology, not only we have the opportunity to potentially um, change a lot of diagnostics and treatments that may help the pet owner one day if they were unlucky enough, unfortunate enough to have cancer. I feel like that even strengthens the bond that we have together with both the pet parent and the pet itself. And that's really the most rewarding part that I have. Oh, that does sound very rewarding, right? Making those bonds and then also how we can help everybody. Like you said, that full circle of helping the animals and helping people. So I think this has been a wonderful conversation, Dr. Choi. It's really been my pleasure to get to learn more about you, hear your opinions. It's been very insightful. And I really just want to thank you again for being part of this podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was an honor to be here. Thanks, Rachel. Well, that's it for this episode of the Veterinary Cancer Pioneers Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and gained valuable insight, we would be so grateful if you could mention our podcast to your friends and colleagues. The Veterinary Cancer Pioneers Podcast is presented to you by Infomed.